Good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Makale University for inviting me here to be amongst you and share uh, whatever I have with regard to language development, um, language shift, and language maintenance. Uh, I have to say that I'm extremely glad to get all the friends here, some of whom I got here. And I have a lot of friends with whom I studied at universities and colleges. And I know there are, from this part of the country, there are so many friends I have with whom I worked as colleagues. And I have so many beloved friends today. And therefore, I am so happy to be here today. OK, thank you very much for coming and, and listening to my lecture. Um, <clears throat> This topic was originally designed uh, as a response to what I have said in one of the uh, in in one of the occasions at one time regarding language development, uh, particularly how to develop uh, the Oromo language. I was invited to a place, and then I was giving my suggestions how to develop the Oromo language. Uh, as a result, there was a lot of dust that has been raised because of that comment, and I had to explain my theoretical basis and my theoretical background why I say that point. And therefore, uh, <clears throat> here it says, it's an linguistic vitality theory, and I'm talking about one particular theory there are so many theories about language development, about language shift and language maintenance, language reversal and language death. But really, I am going to be uh, limited only to one theory that I call, uh, and the linguists call, ethno-linguistic vitality theory as applied to one particular language. It was designed, as I said, how it was relevant to the development of the Oromo language. Now you can take it how it will be relevant to the development of the Tigrinya language. Uh, and then in my today's lecture, I would be talking about three important points, languages of the world, the concept of vitality, and the factors affecting ethnolinguistic vitality. Um, and then I will say what ethnolinguistic vitality itself means. Okay, when we come to the first, the, the, the introduction, in the world there are about 6,000 languages or more. Um, we don't know exactly the, name, the, the, the number, that is why we say it is more than, more than or le approximately about six to sometimes 7,000 languages. And out of these six or 7,000 languages that we do have in the world today, only half will go to the next century. The other half of them will obviously die in the next century. This is how, what the research indicates today, because of the development of science and technology, and because of the coming together of people, because many people leave their own languages and resort into using other languages, obviously because of the cultural mix and because of the travel within the world today, only about 3,000 will go to the next century. The other will, will die, obviously. Uh, because it is expected that every two weeks, one language dies in the world. Uh, in 2005, there were 2,132 languages in Africa. This is in Africa. Out of these, only 336 are not threatened by death. That means these are the strong languages that are for sure to, to go to the next century. Uh, they are not threatened because, because of so many factors. Uh, and then we will see how language will be strong and how language will be maintained and why languages become weak and why they die. So I don't know whether our languages will be out of these 336 languages that are not threatened by death. Hopefully, we will, we will have 
many of them in our country, I suppose. Um, so, in the, 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 the one single language, the one single country that has the largest number of languages in the world, it is a small island known as the Papua New Guinea. It has about 820 languages, one single country. Um, when I conducted this research, th th this, these data some years back, the number of languages that were spoken or used in Papua New Guinea was about 850. About 30 of them are gone now within six or five years. They are gone, they've died. Um, and then as time goes on, many smaller languages will perish. That's obvious. In Nigeria, there are about 410 languages. In Ethiopia, we have about 70 to 80 languages. Why do we say from this to that? Because there is no clear demarcation between a dialect and a language. That means, for example, the Semitic languages were one. The Cushitic were one. If you take in the south, for example, if you take the Dauro language in Ethiopia, if you take the Walaita, if you take um, uh, the, the, Walaita, the Walaita, the Dauro, uh, and then the Gamo, they are almost, they used to be the dialect of one single language. That means <clears throat> when the speakers of the same language become too many, and then they travel far apart from one another. In case of very limited communication, then slight variation begins to emerge at word level, at phrase level, and then at sentence level. When it becomes so much apart to the, to the extent that they cannot understand one another, that dialect will develop into another language. First, for example, the speakers of the same language will find it difficult to understand one another on 10 to 20 percent of the languages or the vocabulary they use, for example. But as time goes on, if there is no communication, especially if there is no education, that difference will become wider and wider. And at some point, they fail to understand one another. Therefore, that dialect will become a fully fledged language. That is why we say languages, languages are born, languages develop, and then languages die. But today in the world, there is, there, it does not seem that possibility does exist. Because I don't think that we will have more languages to be born hereafter. Because communication, communication has bridged the gap. Now there is no possibility in which one single dialect will eventually, the misunderstanding becomes greater and then develop into a new language. That possibility is very rare now, though it is not closed. So that is why we say there are 70 to 80 languages in Ethiopia. We cannot say this language is, for example, the Konso language used to be exactly the same with Afan Romo. But about 20% of the 20% uh, of the vocabulary became different, and then later 30% became different, and then 40% became different, and then it now it has been impossible to, 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 to understand one another. Therefore, it became one language, and then it became different, a separate one. So what I'm saying is, here is that our languages will never, the number of languages in our, in our, in our country plus in other parts of the world it will never, does not seem to increase in the future but it is obvious that the number, the number of languages will decrease. So um, <clears throat> there is one language that survived death uh, in the world that, that is the, the Hebrew language. The Hebrew was extinct 
but they revived the Israelis revived their language and it is one of the most vibrant languages of the world today because the people are so strong the speakers are so strong and that is what we call the ethnolinguistic vitality the strength of the people the strength of that group of people that speak that particular language if they are strong obviously their language will get strong that's it so Hebrew is one of the languages that has risen from from dust that has that, that, that has revived that has been revised okay the concept of <clears throat> vitality when we talk about <clears throat> the concept of vitality we always talk about a group of people speaking one particular language there are so many groups in one given place at at one given time and languages like or speakers groups of speakers of one language are always at competition with the speakers of other languages because people like their languages their language is not meant only for communication their way of thinking is there in the language. Their culture is there in the language. <coughs> their values that uh, they inherited from their parents and from their ancestors is deep-rooted in the language. Therefore, people like their languages. And people do not like their languages to perish, to die. No people like. No group of people would like its language to die. <coughs> So they compete with one another in order to exist as a group. This competition is sometimes healthy and sometimes unhealthy. <coughs> like we see in, an, in, 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 in our country, for example. It's not a healthy competition. If one tries to develop his own language in his own way, in a positive way, that is a healthy kind of competition <clears throat> but that is not the case in many parts of the world and language becomes the source of conflicts so it is possible to maintain to keep to preserve one's own language and there is also a possibility in which one person leaves his own language and shifts into using another person's or another group's language and there are times also when altogether a given language <coughs> dies. <coughs> so this all depends upon the strength of the speakers. This is what we call ethno-linguistic vitality. And language maintenance, language shift, and language death does not occur within one night. It is a long process. The development is a long process and the, the death is even longer process. It takes longer process. But eventually, if language is not used, language will obviously die. So <clears throat> this vitality theory is a theory that tries to study why languages are or ethnolinguistic groups are strong and why they maintain their language why they keep their language and why they leave their language and shift to the use of another language so it became a separate field of study within sociolinguistics in the late 1970s and specifically speaking it became a fully Plagued the field of study around 1979, towards the end of the century. So, <clears throat> what is ethnolinguistic vitality? Ethnolinguistic vitality is that which makes a group of speakers distinct or different from other speakers. So, if a group has strong ethnolinguistic vitality 
then his language will continue. That language will be maintained. If not, if the ethnolinguistic vitality is, is lesser or no vitality at all, that group of people will abandon his language and resort into using the other language. So there are contributors for this. What are the things that make a language or a group of people who speak the same language strong or vital and what makes it less vital? One is demographic factor. Demography refers to the numbers, the absolute number, the, the number, the total number of people speaking the language. This is a simple common understanding. The higher the number of the speaker of a language, then the stronger is the vitality. The stronger is the vitality. The stronger the vitality, then the higher probability for the language to be maintained, to exist longer. So demography is one important factor. And when we talk about demography, one is number and another is the distribution. Why does the number of a given language speaking group grow or become less? the absolute number decreases or increases because of the birth rate versus the death rate. If the birth rate is <coughs> lesser than the death rate, or if the death rate is bigger than the birth rate, the fertility rate, then the number of that speakers will decrease, obviously. This, sorry, this is a simple logic. This is what by which the Europeans are being threatened, for example. The Europeans say this black race is overwhelming us because their fertility is so high and they are overwhelming us. And finally, what will be what will be the fate of these white people? What will be our future? That is what worries them. Their fertility is lower as compared to the, the colored people like ourselves, especially the black. So if the birth rate is small and the death rate is high, then the absolute number will decrease and the speaker of the language decreases, therefore the vitality decreases. Another thing is the endogamy versus the exogamy. This is a point right, that, that raised in my, in my comments there, that raised a lot of dust, I said, okay? They say because as the, this is a science. This is what the research indicates. This is not my own propaganda. This is not my own, my own assertion. But this is proven, scientifically proven, and research proven. Endogamy, if the marriage within, within the same group is high, then the vitality will be higher. But if the speaker of one language gets married by a large number to other groups of speaking, uh, other uh, language speaking group, then the language vitality, the linguistic vitality will decrease because it decreases the absolute number. If someone, the, 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 the husband speaks one language and the, the wife speaks another language, then the possibility that that child will grow bilingual is rare. Usually takes up one and leaves one, the other one. Therefore, there is high, there, there is half, half, half probability, 50% probability that it will decrease. And this, this depends upon a lot of factors. Who is a wife and who is a husband? Which social status? Which economic status? Which one does really consider himself or his language important? And which one does 
think that his language is inferior to his couples. So because of that, endogamy is said to have contributed to less vitality. It contributes to less vitality. It is in, risk, in rare cases, as, science, uh, as research indicates, in which the child grows bilingual. If that is a possibility, that would have been good. But that's not the case. Reality doesn't show that. Research doesn't indicate that. Therefore, it is advised. It is advised that in order to maintain one's language, endogamy is encouraged. It is encouraged. It's not my assertion again. <laughs> it's not my assertion. This is what it is. This is what it is. Uh, like I said, in many places, <clears throat> marriage is, as, as a contract is not a simple thing. It's not usually done by some kind of calculation. No one would go back to the, well, my language is going to die, this and that. Usually it is determined by extra, extra affairs, ex extra things. Usually, you might have seen <clears throat> in many families, Many, many, many children or many young people get married to someone whom the family never approves. Whom the family never <laughs> approves. They say, don't get married to this guy, he's not a good person. Yet, she will go crazy about it. That's not possible. <laughs> Love is more than that. Love is more, more than that. And <clears throat> so, all I'm saying is, I'm, I'm talking... Hmm? Yeah, yeah, he. <laughs> okay. Sorry for, for using the sexist language. Yeah. It is, it is in fact, the men that get more crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The women, usually, even if they, they, they usually, they control their emotion, emotions and it is usually the men that get more crazier, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that, that, that's the point. And then the next thing is immigration versus immigration. <coughs> the number of people that are coming and joining that speaker group and the number of people that go away from that <coughs> language speaking group. If the men or if the population that is coming and joining them is greater, then the ethno-linguistic vitality will be greater. If the same people, if the, these speakers are leaving the space, then the ethno-linguistic vitality will be lesser, and then the absolute number will decrease. Therefore, the vitality will decrease. Um, and then the first one I said is, absolute number, and the second one is the distribution, as far as the population goes, as far as the demography goes. The, distrib the distribution. Where are these people living? Where do they live? If they live very close to one another, then they maintain their language better, because the vitality will be higher. If this, 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 this group of, you know, we, we are about maybe about 100 or so, if 100 of, 100 of us <coughs> are taken to one place and then settled together, then we will t we'll maintain our language. It is true. But if this group, 1,000, 100 people, just picked <coughs> one by one and then just put amongst other people, like uh, drops in an ocean, then that language will be lost. Our languages will be lost. So it is not only the number that matters, but how close are they? How close are they living together? That is why usually people who know each other try to look for one another and form a kind of colony somewhere where they can socialize and live together so that they can maintain their language, so that they can maintain their identity. 
because the vitality, the strength of the language and the strength of that community will be higher, obviously. So it is not only the number alone that matters, but the distribution. In the dis distribution, I said the concentration is one, and the other is, do these people live in their national territory, in their original traditional territory? That is why, for example, just to mention, though this is a bit of politics, why we were opposing the eviction of so many Oromos from Addis Ababa, around Addis Ababa. We say, when they are taken from their place, they are lost, their language is gone. <clears throat> the language is gone. Do they live in their traditional place, in their national place, where they were born and brought up, where they were born and raised? If a group, a community, <coughs> is there where it was born and brought up or raised, then there is a high probability that the linguistic vitality will be higher and there is higher chance again to maintain its own language and identity. If you take away, if you uproot it, if you evict from this place, it's gone. That's the, the, there is high possibility. And then the other one is, what is the number of the speaker of a language in terms of the proportion of other, other ethno-linguistic groups that live around him? We have said that language, language is not spoken in a vacuum, and that it has a situation in this space, and therefore it is competes with other speakers. <coughs> therefore, in the speakers, in the competition among intergroups, the proportion matters. The proportion, what to what, the ratio, the ratio, the <coughs> proportion. That is what, that, uh, uh, that's another point. So, the first point, in order, the vitality, to, to, to one of the indicators of vitality is demography, and the second one is the institutional support. In institutional support, we see the formal institutional support and informal institutional support. The formal institutional support refers to the degree to which the members are represented in decision-making positions in the Kabale level, in the Warada level, in the higher level, in the regional level, or if you take Ethiopia as a country uh, uh, at the federal level, what is the representation? How is that ethno-linguistic group represented? Is it adequately represented in decision-making <coughs> positions? So, no, it's not only the number, mind you. Mem number. Number is not as such. It is one factor, in fact, but that is not enough. Adequate representation where decisions are made. That is what we call, if that is the case, then there is an instrumental, uh, uh, institutional support. We say it has an institutional support. Is it supported by an institution. If we take our country, for example, there are so many ethnic groups that do not seem at all to be represented in the federal level. You don't see in the federal level, for example, which you don't see in the federal level. You can, we can name so many of them. Their number is too much, but we don't find. If, if, even in the civil service, if you take the Somalis, in Ethiopia, in the civil service, you don't, you don't <laughs> find one person, for example. You don't see them anywhere. This is an, an institutional support. They want to be, they want, they, they need to be represented everywhere. Their presence must be felt in decision-making areas. That's it. So, 
the, the media, take the media, for example, one of the institutional supports we have is the media, the print media and the broadcast media or the electronic or whatever media. Take a given ethno-linguistic group, a group that speaks one particular language, and look at the media, look at the radio, look at the TV, How many TVs does that ethno-linguistic group have, for example? How many hours does it broadcast, for example? How many newspapers are there written in that language, for example? How many <laughs> magazines are published yearly, annually, or biannually, whatever? How many? How much media does it have? It says that, for example, this particular language has become now the, it has become the, uh, uh, the language of the media. And when, when I prepared this, for example, <clears throat> some questions uh, came that uh, now, now Afano Romo has become uh, the language of the media and uh, you, you still complain about underdevelopment. The thing is, I say, yes it is, but how many hours does it broadcast, for example, on the <coughs> television, on the radio, for example, as compared to the language with which it competes? Because language is in competition. Language competes like, like any other thing. This is a world of competition. But let that, help that competition be healthy. That is our objective. But competition must exist. So when we take... When we take into account the mass media, the number of hours that it is transmitted, the number of copies that is published every day in a given language has something to do with the vitality, ethno-linguistic vitality of that group. The language that has media broadcast for 100 hours a week is by no means equal to, ethno linguistic vitality is not equal to the language that is broadcast five hours a week, for example. One hour a week, one hour a day. <coughs> there are some languages in which there is only transmission for one hour a day seven hours a week. But some languages, hundreds of hours. So it's never competed. It is never. Because in the number of hours that is transmitted, then the vitality gap becomes greater and greater. And even in the content, the content. You know, I was complaining about the final rumor again. The content. <laughs> the content is not the one that people would like to listen to sometimes. If we must mer mazrat kind of thing. Do people really like to, to, to listen to that? Where there are FM radios well, where they use would like to, 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 to listen to love songs and then love stories and romantic things and the like, you know. They resort into, just ignore this, this is a final rumor, just ignore it and then they will resort to another one. Because the content doesn't attract them, the content. So it is not, when, when you take the media, then a lot of, there, there, there are a lot of players dry facts, dry <laughs> politics. This politics, you know. How many, are, how many people are really interested in politics day in and day out? Seven days, 24 hours a week. I don't know. So, the content also matters. When it comes to education, <clears throat> when it comes to education, in which language is a child being educated is the most important question. In which language? 
if the child is educated in his L1, in his language, then the vitality will be higher, obvious. If he is studying in another language, the vitality will decrease. <coughs> and then in education, not only just not, not only elementary education, if it goes to the secondary education, and then if it goes to the tertiary education, then the higher you, the higher you bring it, and then the more vitality you inject into it, and the more strength you give it, you give the language. If you limit it to grade four, the one that comes to up to grade five is more vital or has more vitality than the language that is in which the child learns up to grade four. So as much as you take it higher, as much as you broaden the scope, then the vitality will be greater. The strength of the language will be greater. So, in education, not only formal education, if you can provide vocational, vocational education, professional education with it, then, as I said, as much as you broaden the scope, then the vitality will be greater. So there were times when there are a lot, when a lot of policies come and then they say, sometimes, I was against the idea, for example, personally as an educator, plus an, as, an, as, as a language activist, to the idea that says our children or our students were not successful in the university because they were not educated in English because they were educated in their vernacular language, in their L1. I'm against that. Because there is, you know, the concept, every concept will be clear, clear when you study it in your own language other than the, the language of other people. So it is, it is not because you are educated in your own language that the quality of education has failed and we are not successful in the university. It's not because of that. There are 101, maybe 1,001 reasons why the quality of education has declined. And this, is, <clears throat> this must be left to, but there is no one single research that will show that it is because of the fact that children are educated in their language, in their own language, that the quality of education has declined. No research has indicated that. In fact, it indicates otherwise. It suggests otherwise. When one is educated in his own language, one will understand better, obviously. And all the developed countries in the world are developed, so developed because of the fact that they are educated in their own languages. Okay, and then, so the idea, so, so many education policies come and go, sometimes met with, with so many oppositions because they want to limit it to a certain level and they want to broaden the scope. But, again, we insist that, I personally insist that, as educator again and then as a language activist, the education of oneself to the maximum we can. So again, from education, we'll go to the, the government if the language is the language of the language with which the services of the government are rendered, given. If you walk into every office and then get the service in your own language, <coughs> then that language will develop. Because the ethnolinguistic vitality the vitality will be higher, and there is a great possibility, probability for that language to, to be maintained, to be maintained, to be preserved. If you don't use it, it will be the language in the household only. The language, the do, it will become a domestic language. Domestic language, you know, that, 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 that lives there and then dies there. 
So a language in order to develop or to gain vitality, then it must be the language of the government. Whatever, which offices you walk to, you go to, if people are getting their services in the language they understand, then there is a high probability that they preserve their language and they become <coughs> proud about their prestige. And then in the industry and others. The other, the other thing that has been recently added into the ethnolinguistic vitality theory is the presence and quality of leaders. There must be linguistic or language activists who stand on behalf of an ethnolinguistic group and who shall fight for the interest of that interest group, for, for that ethnolinguistic group. So the existence of quality leaders, their number plus their quality matters a lot. Who speak on behalf of that ethnolinguistic group? For example, that is why I don't buy the idea that says uh, just getting organized according to ethnicity, this and that, ethnic politics, whatever, does not work. That is why I fail it. I fail to accept it. There must be, there must be activists and political leaders even that would stand in order to promote and protect the interest of that ethnolinguistic group. That is it. Uh, and then institutional support from formal one, and then we'll come to the informal one. The informal one is the degree to which the ethnolinguistic group members organize themselves as a pressure group. That is in the government offices, in education, in the media, and whatever. But this one is in the, in the realm of religion. In which language do you practice your religion? In which language do you practice your, 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 your religion? This is part of an informal one. It's a pressure group that promotes and keep the interest of a given ethnolinguistic group. The culture, the culture includes the physical culture and also the un intangible ones, the way you practice the various ceremonies, the way you dress, your cost costumes, all this. <coughs> Which culture? Which culture? For example, here it says, sometimes people say the Ethiopian culture. Which one is the Ethiopian culture? Which one is the Ethiopian cultural dress, for example? Which one is that? That's very difficult to understand. Because Ethnolinguistic groups are here, there, in Ethiopia. And which one are we referring to, is a question. So the culture, is there, is, is there any, any pressure group in which, where you practice your, your song, where you practice your dance, where you practice your music? Many... <clears throat> Ethnolinguistic groups in this country, for example, even don't have space. They don't have space to practice. They don't have space to show, for example. The theaters, the cinema houses don't allow them. And many of them are not really regarded as ethnolinguistic groups where they can where, where, can, where, where they can exhibit their culture, show their culture. On the, on the, also in politics, how are they organized in politics? Is there, any, is there any provision, any organization, any political entity that would speak in terms of or on behalf of that ethno-linguistic group? If there is no one, then the ethnolinguistic vitality will be lesser because in the formal representation we've said, 
and then in the informal one here, if they don't have enough representation, policies are designed in such a way that they, are, they suit only one particular culture and favor particular ethno-linguistic groups. But if they have political activists and language activists, for example, if they have decision-making people, if they have strong people at decision-making points, then they will be adequately represented. And then in policy-making, they will have their share as well. So that policy will, one way or the other, will be the reflection of the interest of the entire people or the entire population. Otherwise, it will end up reflecting the interests of one particular group <coughs> only. So the third one is the economic factor. The first one is the demographic. The second one is the institutional support. And then the third one is the status factor. How is that ethnic group viewed? How do people look at that ethno-linguistic group? How do you look at them? Do people respect them? Do people despise them? Do people like to get friends of them? Do people like, you know, have some kind of relationship with them? Do people think that they will benefit in their relationship? How are they seen in the society? How are they seen in the country is the status. What is their economic status? If the economic status of an ethno-linguistic group is high, if it is strong economically, then ethno-linguistic vitality will be higher, obviously. Everybody would like to speak the language of that group. If you are poor, why do people like to, 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 to speak the language of the poor? Why do we speak English? Why do we really to affirm, want to affirm ourselves as English speakers? Because it is the language of the wealthy people. It's the language of the strong people. It's the language of the civilized people. We want to associate, we want to buy some, we want to associate ourselves with them. Hmm? And we, we would like to, you know, to, to act like them, speak like them, do like them. Because we want to get that prestige that the language brings. So economic status is not a simple thing. And how Hebrew has revived, one of the reasons is because the Israelis are strong economically. Wherever they are, they are strong. You know, if someone, a strong person has, uh, speaks a particular language and if you want to get, you know, if, 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 you, if, you, are, if you have a business transaction with him, I think the first thing is you greet in his language. You greet him in his language. You want his friendship. So, Economy is so important in the development of ethno-linguistic vitality. When your economy dwindles, when your economy, economy declines, your status begins to decline as well. That's it. Whether we like it or not, this is a reality. The social status. Social status. How do people look at them? Do people respect these guys? Do they respect them? Do they respect? For example, if you if you become uh, if someone if you become a prime minister, then anybody who, who does not know you say no no he's he's my uncle, he's, uh, <laughs> he's not, not. everyone would like to associate with you because your status has gone, and then someone would like to share that status with him somehow. The status. It is so important. They want to share that respect, that respect, that love, that prestige. They want the prestige. 
So if your <coughs> prestige is high, if your economy is high, if you are a respected person, likely the language you speak is respected. The ethno-linguistic vitality will be higher, and then the use of the language, many people would like to learn the language, many people would like to communicate in the language. So social status is so important. And it is also socio-historical status. What is your history yesterday? History of the defeated? History of the poor? History of the underdog? History of the victorious? History, history of the heroes? That is why people who are not hero would like to, to assume themselves as heroes. Because it, it matters. <laughs> it matters. They know that it brings them, it earns them some kind of respect. And with that is associated who you are and your group, your entity, the community you belong to, also respected with it. So you associate, you want to associate with people. That is why so many people deny their own history, deny their own ancestry, deny their own heritage, and they claim the heritage of other people whom they think that they have good history and good respect. <laughs> they run away from themselves. They run away. That history may be true, but may not also be true. But they run away from themselves. Why? Because they seek status. <coughs> they want socio-historical status. That is why so many people say, nah, no, I don't belong to that group. I don't know that group. I don't believe in, in ethnicity. I don't believe in this and that. <laughs> they run away. Because they don't want to tell who they are. But they are someone. They are someone. They know who they are. If you ask them, and I, I know my father and my grandfather, but I don't, I don't know otherwise. I don't know the others. <laughs> They know for sure. Many of them know, but they don't want to express. Because that, that person, that their, 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 their grandfather or great-grandfather is from the one they think does not have any prestige. So they are running away from it. They run away from it. So status factors are so essential. They are so important. If you are proud in your, in your socio-historical status, then you will keep your language. You will keep your identity. You will stay who you are. You don't run away from yourself. And then the language status. How do people say? Am I running out of time, maybe? I have to shorten it. Okay, I'm, okay well, I'm done. Okay, so the language status, the language status. How is the language now? How is it in, on the market today? How is it on the market? Is it viable? If I write something in this language, do people buy? If I have to do something or uh, prepare or, or, or uh, pub publish something, will people buy it? Do people like it? Is it on the market? These are the important points. So these are the ethno-linguistic uh, vitality factors that we would, uh, these were, before that, these are known as the objective ethno-linguistic vitality influencers. But there are Subjective ethno-linguistic vitality influencers. These are objective. Demography is objective. You can count the number of people. Institutional support is also objective because you can count how many medias you have and how many representations you have, how many churches you have or mosques you have, how many this and that you have. These are objective. You can count them objectively. You can collect the data like that. And then about the status, though a bit, but that is also possible to objectively evaluate it. But the subjective vitality, 
there is what we call subjective vitality. What do people think about their demography, for example? You know, in America, once in the 1960s, there was a time when the, the, the white people, being more than 90% or 80% of the population, when they started thinking that we are overwhelmed by the blacks, they consider themselves as though they are in the ocean of the black people. The black people are only 10 or 20 percent. They are 80 percent, but they started thinking that, oh my goodness, now these black people are overwhelming us, you know? <laughs> this is subjective, how they think about their number. If you think that your number is lesser, then the vitality will be less. You will consider yourself inferior. You begin to think like that. Therefore, if you think you, 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 you are not adequately represented anywhere, then the vitality will be lesser. Therefore, you will leave your language, maybe, and then you will resort into using the language of other people. You will shift. So that's it. So um, in order to, uh, uh, to bring my, con my, uh, my presentation to, to the end, I would say, I would conclude by uh, the speech of this quotation of the former UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Coyar, which is, is, is spoken in 1996. He said, put the people in chains, put them in chains, strip them, take their clothes, plug their mouths, they are still free. Take away their job, their passport, the table they sit on, and the beds they sleep in. They are still rich. A people become poor and enslaved when they are robbed of the tongue left to them by their ancestors. Then they are lost forever. That's it. If they take away anything from you, you are still rich. If they plug their mouths or put you in prison or whatever they do, you are still free. But if they take the tongue that you, your ancestors have, have given you, you are lost forever. That's it. So it is good to keep one's own, one's own language, but it should be, it should be not at the expense of others. In a positive way. We live in the, in, the, in, the, in the competitive world, we compete, and we live side by side. So in, like I said, in Papua New Guinea, where there are 800 something languages, there is no fight. You don't hear war. You don't hear anything. They have never become the, the news headlines. We have never heard them fighting. Here we have 80, 70. They are not too much. There is nothing to fight over them. There is nothing. They are our beauty, in fact, if we can use. If you can speak two, three languages, that is the best thing. If we can use more languages, then we exploit the knowledge, the culture, the values, that are within these languages. Therefore, it is good to be bi bilingual, and it is better to be trilingual, quadrilingual, multilingual, possibly. It is good, and our <coughs> world outlook will become broader as much as the languages we speak are getting bigger and bigger. Therefore, someone who speaks more languages is better than someone who does not speak as much languages as that person. So we would keep our languages, and then we will learn the languages of other people in order to win friendship, in order to gain love and respect from other societies as well, plus in order to gain as much knowledge as we can language provides.
Thank you so much. Thank you.